The Red Fairy Book, The Black Thief and Knight of Glen, by Andrew Lang, as read by John Nagoski. Accordingly, in the dead hour of the night, the king's three sons and the thief of Sloan attempted the steed of bells in order to carry him away. But before they could reach the stables, the steed neighed most terribly and shook himself so, and the bells rung with such noise that the knight and all his men were up in a moment. The black thief and the king's sons thought to make their escape, but they were suddenly surrounded by the knight's guards and taken prisoners, where they were brought into that dismal part of the palace where the knight kept a furnace always boiling, in which he threw all offenders that ever came in his way which in a few moments would entirely consume them. "'Audacious villains,' says the knight of the glen, "'how dare you attempt so bold an action as to steal my steed? See, now, the reward of your folly. For your greater punishment I will not boil you all together, but one after the other, so that he that survives may witness the dire afflictions of his unfortunate companions.' So saying, he ordered his servants to stir up the fire. We will boil the eldest looking of these young men first, said he, and so on to the last, which will be this old champion with the black cap. He seems to be the captain, and looks as if he had come through many toils. I was as near death once as the prince is yet, says the black thief, and escaped, and so will he too. No, you never were, said the knight, for he is within two or three minutes of his latter end. But, says the black thief, I was within one moment of my death, and I am here yet. How was that? says the knight. I would be glad to hear it, for it seems impossible. If you think, sir knight, says the black thief, that the danger I was in surpasses that of this young man, will you pardon him his crime? I will, says the knight, so go on with your story. I was, sir, says he, a very wild boy in my youth, and came through many distresses. Once in particular, as I was on my rambling, I was benighted and could find no lodging. At length I came to an old kiln, and being much fatigued I went up and lay on the ribs. I had not been long there when I saw three witches coming in with three bags of gold. Each put their bags of gold under their heads, as if to sleep. I heard one of them say to the other that if the black thief came on them while they slept, he would not leave them a penny. I found by their discourse that everybody had got my name into their mouth, though I kept silent as death during their discourse. At length they fell fast asleep, and then I stole softly down, and seeing some turf convenient, I placed one under each of their heads, and off I went, with their gold, as fast as I could. I had not gone far, continued the thief of Sloan, until I saw a greyhound, a hare, and a hawk in pursuit of me, and began to think it must be the witches that had taken the shapes, in order that I might not escape them unseen, either by land or water. Seeing they did not appear in any formidable shape, I was more than once resolved to attack them, thinking that with my broad sword I could easily destroy them. But considering again that it was perhaps still in their power to become alive again, I gave over the attempt and climbed with difficulty up a tree, bringing my sword in my hand and all the gold along with me. However, when they came to the tree, they found what I had done, and making further use of their hellish art, one of them was changed into a smith's anvil, and another into a piece of iron, of which the third soon made a hatchet. Having the hatchet made, she fell to cutting down the tree, and in the course of an hour it began to shake with me. At length it began to bend, and I found that one or two blows at the most would put it down. I then began to think that my death was inevitable, considering that those who were capable of doing so much would soon end my life. But just as she had the stroke drawn that would terminate my fate, the cock crew, and the witches disappeared, 
having resumed their natural shapes for fear of being known, and I got safe off with my bags of gold. Now, sir, says he to the knight of the glen, if that be not as great an adventure as ever you heard, to be within one blow of a hatchet of my end, and that blow even drawn, and after all to escape, I leave it to yourself. Well, I cannot say, but it is very extraordinary, says the knight of the glen, and on that account pardon this young man his crime, so stir up the fire till I boil this second one. Indeed, says the black thief, I would fain think he would not die this time either. How so, says the knight, it is impossible for him to escape. I escaped death more wonderfully myself, says the thief of Sloan, than if you had him ready to throw into the furnace. And I hope it will be the case with him likewise. Why, have you been in another great danger, says the knight? I would be glad to hear the story too. And if it be as wonderful as the last, I will pardon this young man as I did the other. My way of living, sir, says the black thief, was not good, as I told you before, and being at a certain time fairly run out of cash, and meeting with no enterprise worthy of notice, I was reduced to great straits. At length a rich bishop died in the neighborhood I was then in, and I heard he was interred with a great deal of jewels and rich robes upon him, all of which I intended in a short time to be master of. Accordingly, that very night I set about it, and coming to the place, I understood he was placed at the further end of a long, dark vault, which I slowly entered. I had not gone in far until I heard a foot coming towards me with a quick pace, and although naturally bold and daring, yet, thinking of the deceased bishop and the crime I was engaged in, I lost courage and ran towards the entrance of the vault. I had retreated but a few paces, when I observed between me and the light the figure of a tall black man standing in the entrance. Being in great fear and not knowing how to pass, I fired a pistol at him, and he immediately fell across the entrance. Perceiving he still retained the figure of a mortal man, I began to imagine that it could not be the bishop's ghost. Recovering myself, therefore, from the fear I was in, I ventured to the upper end of the vault, where I found a large bundle, and upon further examination I found that the corpse was already rifled, and that which I had taken to be a ghost was no more than one of his own clergy. I was then very sorry that I had the misfortune to kill him, but it then could not be helped. I took up the bundle that contained everything belonging to the corpse that was valuable, intending to take my departure from this melancholy abode, but just as I came to the mouth of the entrance, I saw the guards of the place coming towards me, and distinctly heard them saying that they would look in the vault, for that the black thief would think little of robbing the corpse if he was anywhere in the place. I did not then know in what manner to act, for if I was seen I would surely lose my life. And everybody had a lookout at that time, and because there was no person bold enough to come in on me. I knew very well on the first side of me that could be got, I would be shot like a dog. However, I had not time to lose. I took and raised up the man which I had killed, as if he was standing on his feet, and I, crouching behind him, bore him up as well as I could, so that the guards readily saw him as they came to the vault. Seeing the man in black, one of the men cried that was the black thief and presenting his piece, fired at the man, at which I let him fall, and crept into a little dark corner myself, that was at the entrance of the place. When they saw the man fall, they ran all into the vault, and never stopped until they were at the end of it, for fear, as I thought, that there might be some others along with him that was killed. But while they were busy inspecting the corpse and the vault to see what they could miss, I slipped out, and once away and still away, but they never had the black thief in their power since. Well, my brave fellow, says the knight of the glen, I see you have come through many dangers. You have freed these two princes by your stories. 
but I am sorry myself that this young prince has to suffer for all. Now, if you could tell me something as wonderful as you have told already, I would pardon him likewise. I pity this youth and do not want to put him to death if I could help it. That happens well, says the thief of Sloan, for I like him best myself and have reserved the most curious passage for the last on his account. Well then, says the knight, let us hear it. I was one day on my travels, says the black thief, and I came into a large forest where I wandered a long time and could not get out of it. At length, I came to a large castle, and fatigue obliged me to call in the same, where I found a young woman and a child sitting on her knee, and she crying, I asked her what made her cry, and where the lord of the castle was, for I wondered greatly that I saw no stir of servants or any person about the place. It is well for you, says the young woman, that the lord of this castle is not at home at present for he is a monstrous giant with but one eye on his forehead, who lives on human flesh. He brought me this child, says she. I do not know where he got it, and ordered me to make it into a pie, and I cannot help crying at the command. I told her that if she knew of any place convenient that I could leave the child safely, I would do it, rather than it should be killed by such a monster. She told me of a house a distance off, where I would get a woman who would take care of it. But what will I do in regard of the pie? Cut a finger off it, said I, and I will bring you in a young wild pig out of the forest, which you may dress as if it was the child, and put the finger in a certain place, that if the giant doubts anything about it, you may know where to turn it over at the first, and when he sees it, he will be fully satisfied that the pie is made of the child. She agreed to the scheme I proposed, and, cutting off the child's finger, by her direction I soon had it at the house she told me of, and brought her the little pig in the place of it. She then made ready the pie, and after eating and drinking heartily myself, I was just taking my leave of the young woman when we observed the giant coming through the castle gates. Bless me, said she. What will you do now? Run away and lie down among the dead bodies that he has in the room, showing me the place, and strip off your clothes that he may not know you from the rest if he has occasion to go that way. I took her advice and laid myself down among the rest as if dead to see how he would behave. The first thing I heard was in calling for his pie. When she set it down before him, he swore it smelled like swine's flesh. But knowing where to find the finger, she immediately turned it up, which fairly convinced him of the contrary. The pie only served to sharpen his appetite, and I heard him sharpening his knife and saying he must have a collop or two, for he was not near satisfied. But what was my terror when I heard the giant groping among the bodies, and fancying myself, cut the half of my hip off and took it with him to be roasted. You may be certain I was in great pain, but the fear of being killed prevented me from making any complaint. However, when he had eaten all, he began to drink hot liquors in great abundance, so that in a short time he could not hold up his head, but threw himself on a large creel he had made for the purpose and fell fast asleep. When I heard him snoring, as I was, I went up and caused the woman to bind my wound with a handkerchief, and taking the giant spit, reddened it in the fire, and ran it through the eye, but was not able to kill him. However, I left the spit sticking in his head, and took to my heels, but I soon found he was in pursuit of me, although blind, and having an enchanted ring, he threw it at me, and it fell on my big toe and remained fastened to it. The giant then called to the ring, where it was, and to my great surprise it made him answer on my foot, and he, guided by the same, made a leap at me which I had the good luck to observe, 
and fortunately escaped the danger. However, I found running was of no use in saving me, as long as I had the ring on my foot. So I took my sword and cut off the toe it was fastened on, and threw both into a large fish pond that was convenient. The giant called again to the ring, which by the power of enchantment always made him answer. But he, not knowing what I had done, imagined that it was still on some part of me, and made a violent leap to seize me when he went into the pond, over head and ears, and was drowned. Now, Sir Knight, says the thief of Sloan, you see what dangers I came through and always escaped? But indeed I am lame for the want of my toe ever since. My lord and master, says an old woman that was listening all the time, that story is but too true, as I well know. For I am the very woman that was in the giant's castle, and you, my lord, the child that I was to make into a pie. And this is the very man that saved your life, which you may know by the want of your finger that was taken off, as you have heard, to deceive the giant. The Knight of the Glen, greatly surprised at what he had heard the old woman tell, and knowing he wanted his finger from his childhood, began to understand that the story was true enough. And is this my deliverer? says he. Oh, brave fellow, I not only pardon you all, but will keep you with myself while you live, where you shall feast like princes and have every attendance that I have myself. They all returned thanks on their knees, and the black thief told him the reason they attempted to steal the steed of bells, and the necessity they were under in going home. Well, says the knight of the glen, if that's the case, I bestow you my steed rather than this brave fellow should die. So you may go when you please. Only remember to call and see me betimes, that we may know each other well. They promised they would, and with great joy they set off for the king, their father's palace, and the black thief along with them. The wicked queen was standing all this time on the tower, and hearing the bells ringing at a great distance off, knew very well it was the princes coming home and the steed with them, and through spite and vexation precipitated herself from the tower and was shattered to pieces. The three princes lived happy and well during their father's reign, and always keeping the black thief along with them, but how they did after the old king's death is not known. This is the end of the story.